now to present uh, Professor Abdul Sharif with a small uh, award that we've prepared. So, Professor Abdul Sharif, if you could please come up to the stage. <laughs> please, Professor Abdul Sharif. <laughs> It's really a very, a very simple token of, of appreciation and of the day or the year that you spend with us. And from learning so much from you and from your humility and humility of the intellectual affairs. This is just a gift and I hope. I think now I'd like to say only a, really a few words. First, congratulate my friends three or four of them, for having kept such a secret, so secret from me, that I really did not know this is coming. When I volunteered to present a paper, I thought I was presenting like any other paper. And, and suddenly I see myself being described as um, inaugural lecture. I said, I am inaugurating what? <laughs> and I communicated with, um, um, uh, and she said, oh, they're, they're trying to keep a secret. And that's when I began to feel, uh, and literally. So I don't want to say really much more. One thing else that I would like to say, unfortunately we couldn't hear very well. I'm waiting to see the text of it so that I can understand Abdul Sharif, because it seems as if he understands me much better than I do myself. But thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I thought I was just going to be your host here today, but now I've been put in a position feeling a bit uh, shy. And, but thank you very much for, to all of you. Thank you. So I'd like now to uh, invite Professor Abdul Sharif for his keynote lecture titled The Tyranny of the Atlantic Slavery and an Agenda for the Study of Slavery in the Indian Ocean. Let me start by saying assalamu alaikum to all of you who have come and I'm glad that we are meeting today. I've already expressed my, in a way, uh, feelings. And I think probably before, without going any further, I just have to wait to read the whole lecture, the whole uh, speech that he has given. But I will speak what I had uh, prepared for, for this particular one. And the way it came about, when I uh, was asked uh, to present, I thought I was going to make just one other presentation. But it just happened that I was going to offer a critique of uh, the way we are studying this. And it was completely um, accidental and not planned at all. But I think it has become really more appropriate from what uh, we have had so far. And I may be deliberately provocative. Um, my title itself was The Tyranny of the Atlantic versus Islamic slavery. I want it to be that kind of provocative because I think we need a lot of discussion. But particularly because I began to see that uh, as, a, as an African Institute, we, in the Indian Ocean, we have really the position to begin to provide an agenda of what kind of research that we're going to do on, uh, on slavery rather than following uh, the trend that may be going on. And this is why I have uh, drafted my um, title that way. I feel that many studies about slavery tend to be predicated on the Atlantic uh, slavery model, which is taken as the starting point of the study of slavery anywhere. But we forget that slavery has been with us humanity for thousands of years. Um, since the times of all the prophets and all over the globe. And it would be wrong to assume that we can understand that broad uh, picture of uh, slavery by starting with the Atlantic uh, yardstick, which is a very specific type of slavery. And I think that is uh, the important part. Atlantic slavery lasted only about two and a half centuries, from the mid-17th century. 
it was initially estimated by the Bois to have uh, involved 17 million Africans who were taken across the Atlantic. And it left print on uh, the faces and psyche of the people, especially in the West, for people now to look at that as the picture of uh, slavery. And it tends to dominate our understanding of slavery in general. But it was at a very specific moment, moment, which was what Karl Marx had described as the rosy dawn of the capitalist economy. And I think that is very important, that that was the context in which that slavery uh, developed. Now, as we set up an agenda for the study of slavery in the Indian Ocean, we need to start not with the exception case study, but with a more general understanding of the institution of slavery in human history in general. One aspect of the Atlantic uh, 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 slavery, the Yastik that I talked about, has been what I call the game of numbers. In other words, because De Bois said 17 million, and it seems as if a lot of the historians went to go and say, now, what can, how can we get figures to balance that one, to try to reduce it, to uh, make it more acceptable? And we've engaged, uh, quite a few people have engaged in this uh, game of numbers, just trying to count. And uh, uh, in 1960, uh, Curtin started it, maybe earlier other people had done, but Curtin started to try to challenge what Debois had said. He had said 17 million. So he went over the statistics again, all the figures that he could get. But, and I think this is very important how we use our history as well, to carry out that census. He went to record every ship that left Africa to go to the America, counting how many slaves were taken, died on the way, which is all very good statistics not to have. Um, but, and then concluded that actually not, it was not 17 million, but 10.5 million, or somewhat better than uh, what it is before. I mean, that seemed to be having the thinking. But then, and interestingly, I think we should notice how we can misuse history. He said, from 1450 to 1900. Now I said, 1450, as far as the Europeans were concerned, America had not been discovered. It was not discovered, so-called, until 1892 by um, Columbus. So why he start at 1450? What was there. And then 1900, slavery to the Atlantic had been abolished much earlier. And the reason is to broaden the period from 1450 to 1900, and then you, you divide the 10.5 million, and therefore the yearly numbers are reduced. In other words, it seems to be a game, quite frankly, to try to minimize the guilt of the people who are involved in the Atlantic. But then that is roughly reflected on the others. These data now are given live on the, one of the Harvard website. Um, but when I began to look at it, I said, all of these have recorded from customs now how many slaves left, how many were received, etc. And it doesn't take into account that um, people had been smuggling slaves for a long time. So the smuggled slaves are not taken account. Piracy is not taken into account. So in other words, the figures that Curtin had collected was trying to reduce the number to the minimum possible to reduce the guilt, it seems, uh, to me. Anyway, now these figures, the smaller figures now are popularized in textbooks like uh, my friend's uh, textbook, uh, Paul Lovejoy, 
that now itself is 1175, 11.75 uh, million during that period. Um, so, so now I think actually we should begin to really see through the game, the game of numbers that I am objecting to. This is uh, how it is being. Um, but at least one, Curtin did one thing right. And that he called that uh, slave trade Atlantic slave trade. He gave it a geographical label. I think that is important, a geographical label. And that is correct. I would not, I mean, I cannot really question that. It occurred in the Atlantic. That is fine. He did not call it Christian or European because it's precisely that purpose he was really to, to deflect um, criticism from this. And I would, be, I would agree with that. I would not want to blame this on Christianity. Christianity was not responsible for the Atlantic slave trade. It was capitalism that was. But th so that was right to use at least a neutral geographical uh, uh, title. But the problem that came up for me, the first one that really excited my interest, I attended a conference at Princeton in 1978. And I was going to present my paper on slavery in Zanzibar. My book is on slave spices and ivory, as uh, Anson Ko mentioned. And I was going to talk about slavery in Zanzibar. There was no sort of hiding about it. Um, it was economic history, though. Um, but before I could present my paper, um, Ralph Austin from Chicago, he was going to present his paper uh, on West Africa, the first of three papers. And he called it Islamic slavery from West Africa. And he, this was the first of three, as I said. And uh, so since he uh, preceded me, as a more senior scholar, I listened to, to his conference uh, presentation very carefully. And I could not understand any way from his discussion why it was called Islamic. He didn't say anything about it. So when he finished, I said, before I present my paper, I would like to ask, what is Islamic slavery in this? Now, he didn't care to answer about that. He didn't answer at all. And in fact, in publishing that first paper, he removed the, the name, uh, the word Islamic, which would have satisfied me. But then he wrote that two other papers that came later, he brought, put back the word Islamic, and then combined the three papers to give the global and I, I'm not really joking. I, I mean, I can really prove this. Uh, with, you, you can see that his papers have been published separately, those three chapters. Um, that um, he reverted to that Islamic. And since then, people like Lovejoy and so on have taken up that Islamic, Islamic without explaining what was Islamic about it. And I think this is where I, uh, I started. Um, but although he didn't answer, and even since then, the challenge that I raised then verbally and so on, Ralph Austin himself really hasn't joined any kind of the, uh, the debate. But it was Professor Willis at Princeton at that time, and he was described to me as the, the specialist on Islam in West Africa. And he was teaching at Princeton. He decided that he was going to answer what is Islamic um, about it. In this book, in which my, ch my chapter also appears on Zanzibar, but he edited this book, or, uh, or the conference papers. And in the preface, he answers what is Islamic slavery. And I want, I'll read very, very slowly, because each sentence, I think, is 
really quite bad. And I said, what is, and what is Islamic about the institution of slavery? Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was at once a slaveholder and a practitioner of polygamy and concubinage. And since the tenets of Islam are tethered so tightly to the sunnah of the prophet, it is no surprise to discover that slaves, slave and polygamy command such a high, wide presence in the social annals of Islam. He didn't finish there. And concubinage, that forceful feature of universal Islam, fed the insatiable demand for females and placed an unmistak unmistakable cachet upon the character of slavery in Muslim uh, lands. Secondly, is the known practice of the Muslims to liquidate men in jihad and take captive women and children for use in the domestic scheme. Now that I've not seen in history. Um, finally, the stress on the sensual and the paradisical um, passages in the Quran could hardly serve remedy the Eastern melody, which is pederasty. The ideology of enslavement in Islam came to rest upon the premise that the servile estate was predestined to servility. Uh, or, uh, the servile estate was somehow preordained that some persons were predestined to servility as surely as the others were foreordained with the gift of prophecy. And you know where he's hitting all the time. This is nothing less than when I read it. This is a caricature of uh, slavery in Islam. Um, and Edward Said would not have hesitated to say this is a typical example of Orientalism. And this is where I start off. Uh, but before then I go, I mean, even at that time, in, even in 78, there were some people still who had a much better understanding of how to study slavery. And in fact, it was the same year, almost 78, when at a conference apparently, probably in, in Paris, a French historian called uh, Hubert uh, Garba, I do not know whether I'm pronouncing it right, he was launching a UNESCO program on slavery in which he challenged historians not to reduce the history of the slave trade to a paragraph of commercial, in commercial history, merely counting bodies and piastres. He urged them to try to introduce human dimension to it, to give the voice to the transported, to inquire into the life of the people who were leaving and those who had arrived, in short, to study it as part of the total history of civilization. He asked, what place did slavery have in the history of civilization? For dispersion or cohesion, for destruction or construction. In other words, to leave really the study of slavery open and broad and not to to predetermine it, how, where it will go. And I think this is where I think we are now. I think this is where we need to start. There's no better place for us to start, in fact, to understand slavery, is actually to start with learning slavery in Africa itself. Um, because here in Africa, anthropologists for quite a few years have been studying slavery in African societies. And um, there's a, a scholar called Kopitov who has been writing annual uh, um, summaries of these studies on slavery in, uh, in, in Africa. And, uh, and he says actually that the slave of the common Western image 
is first and foremost a commodity to be bought and sold or inherited. He's a chattel totally in the possession of another person. He has no right to person or marriage and no control over the fate of his children. Maybe ill-treated, sometimes even killed with impunity. His progeny inherits his status. Slave as a group form a class apart at the very bottom of the social ladder. The antithesis of slavery is freedom. Now, this is his definition. He's an anthropologist, a Western anthropologist, that this is the concept of a slave in the Western society. And then he looks at Africa. And, and he says that this was quite specific to the capitalist mode of production during the 17th uh, to the 19th centuries, and not a general definition of slavery across continents and centuries. Another younger historian whom I did not know, I just discovered much later, uh, an American historian of West Africa uh, called Ware, and I was surprised actually when I read his uh, uh, chapter, I said, oh, at least I'm not a lone wolf, that at least there is somebody else also who is shouting. Uh, and he started off by saying slavery was not was a socio-economic institution and not a religious one. So to use r religious labels can be just misleading. Although it may be, it may mediate uh, in the religious, um, although, I mean, slavery might uh, be mediated uh, through religious discourse. He argued that the emphasis placed by the Orientalist on female slaves, for example, as objects of sexual uh, desires and was misguided, since a majority of them were in fact employed in domestic work, in agriculture, and only a minority were engaged as slave, uh, slave wives. And this is a, he's a student of Western African history of uh, particular uh, centuries. And even in that domain, the concern among those people in those societies was for reproduction and full integration of children to perpetuate the lineage of the father, regardless of the skin color in Africa. He's talking about Africa in particular. They are more interested about the children who will perpetuate, who will increase the size of the family, and so on. And they were not necessarily worried by skin color. So let me start now on this issue of the relationship between slavery and race. Race tends to dominate discussion about slavery in the West, and it has often been taken as a universal issue of all slave societies. Even the theme of our conference, I must admit, and I think this is a uh, I hesitated whether I should criticize my colleagues, but I think it is good to start with self-criticism. Even in the theme of our conference, this conference here, seems to have been couched in those terms, setting up the Western experience as a yardstick. Because it says, uh, oh wait, did I get it right? It doesn't seem to be going back. Uh, Did you jump us now? Okay. Uh, uh, go forward one. Ah, uh, no, uh, back. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, sorry for, I'm still illiterate. Uh, in some ways, and this is why I bring my son uh, <laughs> along. Now, because our announcement says, and I'm quoting here, recent calls for racial justice in the US have resonated 
with other parts of the world. I do not know whether we asked the rest of the world, how do you, does it resonate? I did not know about this recent uh, call in the, in, the, in the West, but we have assumed that. We should, I feel that we should study different systems of slavery holistically in their own right, within their context, circumstances, which may be compared with other systems, rather than setting a single yardstick and then going along it, even whether it is race, whatever uh, uh, other issue that come up. So let us start with this question of the relationship between slavery and race. Race tends to dominate discussion about slavery in the West. And it has often been taken as a universal issue in all slave societies. Even the theme, I think, no, I think this one was already, already. Uh, okay. No, uh, sort of, I go from that, but I uh, went backwards a bit. Uh, from that last sentence that I said earlier, I quote Ali Mazrui. He says that Indigenous, indigenous slave systems in Africa is uniracial because the people next, living next to each other who were fighting each other and enslaving each other, they were all black. You can hardly use a racial division to, uh, to, uh, to explain it. Um, because and um, the, the, it, may, it may not be an issue in the debate about slavery within Africa. And Kopitov, that I've mentioned, the person who has surveyed uh, studies in, in Africa, he threw out in the a couple of years that I, I read of the papers, annual papers, he never brought up the question of, of race in, in studying African uh, slavery. So obviously it's not relevant there. In fact, Basrui makes a broader comparison in his article on reparations, in which he compares the three major forms of slavery. He says that African society was most absorptive of slaves as eventually full members of the community in a society in which strength lay in the number of tribesmen that you have, as we have seen that, that Kopitov has uh, emphasized. On the other hand, the transatlantic uh, slavery, which flourished with the capitalist commercialization of slavery, was biracial. It owed a great deal to the writings of particularly Christian theologians, who were themselves monogamous, and legitimized the racial inferiority of blacks. So he actually uh, attributes this directly to that particular circumstance. Thus, they emerged as the most racialistic where the child of a white slave owner and his slave woman remained black and slave, regardless of his or her actual complexion and mixture of genes, which he describes as descending miscegenation. And he says North, Africa, North America and Caribbean slavery thus became the most racist of all. Between the two, he says, there is Muslim slavery, which he says was a child of the war system. Prisoners of war being used as enslaved captives. That is the major process by which Arabs were enslaved by other Arabs through wars, facilitated by the strong patrilineal tendency uh, among uh, Arabs who would see that my child through any mother, maybe black or white, still is my child. And that very strong patrilineal tendency had existed you know, throughout this period, and that has functioned even when it was confronted with uh, slavery. 
If the father was Arab, the child was deemed to be Arab, regardless of the racial identity of the mother, which he describes as ascending miscegenation. Now, people actually might uh, object to the word ascending and descending because it still puts a level of different uh, uh, races, maybe. Oh, but here, it's not a question of race. It's classes that you're talking about, whether slave or not slave. The Muslims have a system, um, Muslim slave system was culture conscious, while the Western system was race conscious. In the extreme, least absorptive and permitted the least social mobility. Mazrui does not deny that slavery as practiced by the Muslims he says that it often included prejudice against this or that ethnic group or caste. But skin color was not the central issue uh, in all this between masters and slaves. There was no theory which characterized one race as natural slaves and another as natural masters, contrary to what uh, Professor Willis say, alleged. And I think actually, I mean, the, the, he's a scholar, so people could caution, what can you, how can you say about Islam? Tell us what Islam tells, says itself. And yes, let us go to the Quran and see what it says about slaves. Islam did not invent slavery. And like other religions, it did not abolish it either. To trace the origin of Islamic slavery, we can do no better than go back to the Quran itself the basic source. The, com the common modern term for slaves in Arabic now is Abd. And in uh, uh, the English translation by Pictol translation, there are 102 references to Abd. And when I was also searching through the Quran, through this uh, modern uh, technology, I saw 102, I, saw, I have a lot of material to go through. And I began reading them, and I saw one of them. I knew this. One of the first one who said was Nabi Isa, Jesus, when he was born, and people came to ask his mother, how did he get born? Your mother was not married. And she said, ask the child. And when the child was asked, and he replied, Inni Abdullah, I am the servant of God, and I brought you the Bible. Now, um, he used the word Abd, but there, obviously, the prophets were not slaves of God. They were servants of God, and there's a big distinction there. A, serv a slave has no independence opinion of any sort. Uh, his voice doesn't count, but these are servants. And therefore, you go through the Quran as a whole, most of the references, whenever you see Abd, it refers to the prophets, and there are many of them, as we know, Musa, Isa, Daud, etc., and you go on. So I said, no, so where are the slaves? And you will not find them when you look for under Abd, because they're not there. Only once, apparently, Abd is used to, re, to suggest it is referring to slaves. But in fact, in the Quran, uh, in the, uh, there are 29 references specifically to slaves. And, and that is also what is interesting, that it is not just one word, but it's a long, one foot phrase, ma malakatai manuko, those who your right hand control or owned, or something like that. Which means it's a very specific term that in the Quran that refers to these people. And what does your right hand possess or control? Are captives. And when you immediately you find out that these are male prisoners of war or conflicts between Arab tribes. There will be two tribes 
next to each other, fighting over water or, uh, or uh, grass or whatever. And they would capture each other. So they would be captives. And the correct word uh, in the Quran is really should be captives in, in war, in these kind of wars. Now, when two uh, neighboring tribes are fighting each other, um, and it might become early every few years, and then there may be a fight, and you capture your, uh, some people from your neighboring tribe, and then if you treat them badly or you kill them, the next year when you lose, the other tribe will do the same to your people. And the common sense would be you don't live with your neighbors like that one. Even if you quarrel, you have to somehow conciliate them. And this is why it be begins to make sense that the Quran always talks about treating these captives uh, from, uh, from these intertribal wars to treat them as human beings, to treat them well, because to conciliate the neighboring tribes so that it doesn't become a constant fight year after year, killing each other all the time, in which both of them lose. So I think that is very important. And in fact, there are only 29 references uh, that, uh, that refer to slaves as such. Now when you go um, to, to see what the, the Quran says, then you begin to understand why it, it talks the way, the way it does. Um, the Quran accepts uh, slavery as an element in the society. But slaves were more than a chattel. And their humanity was addressed in reference to their beliefs, their desires for emancipation, etc. What is also significant is that they are generally categorized with the downtrodden members of the society, Mustas Afin, including orphans, the needy, the travelers, and so on. They are always treated in that category of human beings in that society. The Quran repeatedly recommends freeing these captives for all sorts of reasons and rewards. The reason lay in the fact that one tribe may lose some of its members to its neighbor in one battle. And if they treat them badly, then the same thing will happen to, to your uh, relatives. And therefore, it is strange to read in the Quran uh, that religion is connected so directly with uh, slavery directly. Because the Quran says good treatment of slaves and even emancipation for all sorts of reasons, um, which may be unique and would have been considered nonsensical by the Western land, uh, slave owners in, in the American South. And I'll give you the example. The Quran admits that freeing a slave was as difficult as, as climbing a mountain. And the slaves were quite expensive in Hejaz. We'll see the, some of the figures um, given even in the uh, Hadith. Very high figures for cost of uh, slaves. Nevertheless, the masters were encouraged to free them for all sorts of reasons, such as to expiate for certain big sins. In a single chapter, of the Quran, and nisa The Quran offers guidance in human relations, including slaves, who are considered members of the household, together with the wives and children. It recommended, number one, marry women that you like, two, three, or four. And many of the people will stop, see? Islam allows marriage up to four eyes. Yes, it does. But then, they forget the, what follows. But if you fear that you may not treat them fairly, then marry only one. Or among your slave women. And this is the Quran. If you want the surah that I have also. 
Second, it is lawful for you to seek union with your slave women, with your wealth, in wedlock, not in license. This is the Quran saying it. In wedlock, not in license. And give them their dowries. Three, those of you who cannot afford to marry faithful women, then marry among your slave women. All the time the emphasis is on marrying those slave women, not just sleeping with the slave women and then throw them out. Four, good, be good to parents, slaves, I mean, parents, relatives, orphans, the needy, and your slaves. I mean, again, putting that whole group of humanity in one category. I think that is important. And finally, do not compel your female slaves to prostitution. Now, you present this to a, a southern slave owner. What will you think of all this? <coughs> so this is rubbish. OK, that was the Quran. Let's go now to the Hadith. I'm not quite sure whether I'm keeping to the time. I'm enjoying myself, <laughs> as you can see. Sla slavery is uh, hadiths. Why the hadiths separately? The Quran gave the principles, essentially. Doesn't go into that uh, too many details. Only one slave is actually mentioned by name in the Quran. But the hadiths, which were collected um, uh, some period after the Prophet died, essentially to collect what actually happened during that period and how various issues were um, dealt with. And these were collected by uh, some big scholars, and there are some which are considered sahih, accurate. Uh, and so what is important about the Hadith as com compared to the, the Quran, the Quran sets out the principles in general. The Hadith gives uh, the human setting of, of those issues. You know the names of the people, you know the colors of those people, the sex of those people, and everything from the Hadith, because it, then you are able to get the human history of it. So when we look at this, they run, of course, into many, many volumes of this, but they also contain a lot of social history uh, of the times. They expand on the circumstances under which slavery as an institution operated and how slaves were to be treated according to Islamic ethics. While the Quran defined the broad principles, it is in the Prophet's tradition that we get to see the practical operation of uh, the principles in life. Seem to have gone. Yeah, taking Bukhari as a good uh, example, as a representative of these compilations, slaves appear 631 times in the hadiths. But many of them may be different versions of the same slave. Um, so they contradict, they sometimes contradict, sometimes really reinforce each other. So they are useful. But they refer to a total of 105 slaves during that whole period in all these thousands of hadiths. They give details on the composition of these slaves, their position in the early Muslim society, how they were treated, which they eventually were incorporated in Islamic law. In his farewell, uh, sermon, the prophet said, again, I think the, West, the southern uh, slave owner would find it difficult to understand this. Uh, it says, fear God in the matter of your slaves. Feed them with what you, fear, you feed yourself. Clothe them with, with what you wear. And do not give them work beyond their capacity. Do not cause pain to God's creation. He caused you to own them, and had he so wished, 
he, he would have caused them to own you. Now, since the, the time is, I don't know how many minutes I have? Four. Well, um, there won't be enough time. But I first deal with Arab uh, uh, slaves, because there were Arab slaves, uh, uh, quite a few. But primarily it's because these were intertribal conflicts. And many of them uh, were uh, released. Um, and the reason very often in, in these slaves were, uh, um, captives were taken in the wars in very large numbers in the early wars for, of Islam, for example, when uh, they were fighting uh, different uh, tribes. And uh, in uh, one of the early battles, um, the prophet was given the fifth number of uh, captives you know, for, for, the, uh, for the community, and he freed them all. There was another case after the um, Battle of uh, Badr, um, in which slaves were uh, kept, uh, captured in, in large numbers by, by the Muslims. And um, most of them were freed, because when they were freed, they were hoping that, or there was one particular case where they were given a chance. You can either be freed by being ransomed, or if you become a Muslim, you'll become freed, or if you teach 10 Muslims to read and write, you'll get your freedom among these. There was also occasion uh, uh, adoption, I will, I will leave that. There were uh, Arab women who were married to black slaves. There was one particular case, in fact, she is, uh, has the largest number of, of uh, hadith around her, uh, Barira, uh, who was herself a white woman, uh, a slave, who was married by a black slave. And finally, uh, she, um, she was uh, bought and uh, freed and then refused. And when the prophet tried to intervene and said, why don't you go back to your husband? I said, unless you are ordered me to do it, otherwise I do not want to. And that was the end of the story. So I mean, you have uh, uh, this case as well uh, at that time. Um, there were uh, black slaves but in the, in the Quran, for example, and the, the Quran says, God created tribes so that you understand each other, uh, not to discriminate. Um, I think I'll be probably um, rushing now. I think I will probably do it uh, uh, in writing because I, have, I had a lot of uh, uh, details, uh, this that I will, won't be able to go. Let me go to the conclusion, uh, uh, finally. Uh, conclusion also, I think I have a sort of a, a thing that I reject and then what I want to say. Hanwick is one of the um, good historians who has done a lot of work on Islamic history, so otherwise I respect him. But uh, somehow, I'm not as uh, competent in this. Uh, I've jumped. Which slide are you? I think to go back a bit. Yeah. Uh, just read the text. Yeah. Um, so Hanwick said, Hanwick and um, um, Bernard Lewis, they say that, yes, they accept that Islam has uh, offered these kind of uh, uh, possibilities of freeing the slaves. But then they said, but this freeing of slaves created a shortage of slaves. And therefore, the Muslims then went out to, to fight in order to, to get more slaves. And there is no truth uh, to that. Uh, because during the time of the Prophet, which you can sort of call Islamic slavery in its uh, real way, that it did not occur, because the numbers of slaves existing was small, and there were 
being freed, many of them were these captives on, uh, from wars. So that did not create a shortage of slaves as such to lead to it. The, the actual expansion of the Islamic, or, or I, sh I should say, I do not know how I would call it, Muslim um, um, empires under the Umayyads and the Abbasids, those did not abide by all the tenets of Islam. Not, not all of them, some of them were, uh, were left to, uh, to, uh, to be practiced. But when the, Abbas, the Umayyads and Abbasids, they were collecting revenue and they were going, I mean, um, the Umayyads invaded many states in North Africa who had never invaded, invaded the, uh, the Muslim states. So their capture of those was not legal according to Islamic law. So you cannot blame the, the empires for uh, what has happened um, and, and blame Islam uh, for it. And uh, of course, under the Abbasids, you have um, the large number of slaves, the Zain slaves, who were taken to, the, to Iraq. And there's no question that these slaves were being imported there en masse and really being very badly treated that no Muslim can, can defend that. And ultimately, they arose in a big rebellion. But you cannot really say all of that is Islamic. So after the Prophet, you have to be very selective where principles were uh, respected and where they were, they were not respected for their own um, human, um, uh, their own reasons. At the same time, there are certain institutions of Islam related to slavery. They survived despite all this until the 19th century when slavery was, was ending. Because even at that time, people were still practicing some of the principles of Islam as related to slavery. For example, uh, when uh, uh, the Sultan Barash of Zanzibar was going, coming to, going to London for a visit, he left in his wasiya that if I don't come back, free 200 slaves. Well, he came back alive. And he said, OK, the 200 are, are freed. So the freeing of slaves continued that way. Um, so there are many examples like this. Uh, that, and, and therefore, certain principles of Islamic uh, slavery were practiced by Muslims, but you cannot call all of it as Islamic slavery and condemn it as uh, is being done. I'm sorry I am not as, uh, if I leave the text, then I run over the time. Thank you very much. That's a little bit better, right? If I could speak on behalf of my co-conveners, uh, uh, Raga Abusharov here and, and Uday Chandra sitting in the back. Um, it's a great pleasure to see you all here today. And it's a great pleasure especially to honor Professor Abdul Sharif, whose work has so deeply influenced my own work um, and so deeply influenced the work of many of us both here and around the world generations of scholars on East Africa and the Indian Ocean. In fact, I was just thinking, I studied at the University of Dar es Salaam in the early 1990s. And the very first book that I read on East African history, also the first book I read on history of the Indian Ocean region was Slave Spices and Ivory in Zanzibar. So your work has deeply influenced um, 
my own way of seeing history, uh, as well as my own research, for a very, very long time. Um, I also want to put in a very quick plug for Monsoon. Uh, uh, Salah mentioned Monsoon uh, a moment ago. But in the first issue, which you saw the cover of uh, uh, in his introductory remarks, we feature uh, an extended interview with Professor Sharif. Uh, an interview that touches actually on many of the many of the points that uh, Professor Ensing Ho mentioned earlier, uh, and also an interview that uh, was quite enlightening for me, uh, and I think it will be for many of you as well, because in the interview, uh, Professor Sharif addresses the the arc of his career um, many of your key works of course and also really interestingly how they relate to each other um, uh, and how they fit into different aspects of your uh, career trajectory so i would strongly urge all of you to have a look at that interview when it becomes available very soon uh, in the coming days so with that i'd like to take some questions maybe we could yeah would you like to join me here? We can use the mic and we can uh, take questions from the audience and we still have some time. Please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the remarks, and thank you to the conveners for having us all here. I, I guess I'll start by asking you, since in the title of the talk, you, we have an agenda of what we should be doing, and since maybe we didn't get to the full agenda, what do you think should be on the top, the top priorities for scholars today thinking about this topic? Well, my... My strong, um, um, my usual approach to study this, I'm a materialist. And I feel that to study institutions like slavery, you start studying the society itself from where it is, how does it, how has it grown, how does it live, what is the political economy or the social economy of the society itself. And then within that one, if there is slavery, then it will be related to this. That we don't start with the symptoms like, uh, like uh, uh, racism or uh, any other. These are symptoms. But the political economy itself, you start by studying the economy itself for the people, how they lived, the society, how it is sort of built up. And then if there is slavery there, that you will see that there is a relationship that way. Much more vertical rather than horizontal. Horizontal can be when one conquers the, the other. But quite often, there are internal uh, issues that lead to the emergence of any kind of social institution. And slavery is only one of them. Thank you so much, Professor Sharif. We are all very indebted, indeed. Uh, I have two questions. The first question uh, about something that you wrote a long time ago, but is still extremely vibrant and very important in terms of the differences in slave ownership between Unguja and Pemba. And you mentioned that there were a lot of Africans or indigenous Africans who did own slaver, uh, slaves. So I am with you on the material front on that. So if you can say something a little bit. And I think, uh, uh, if I am not mistaken, I have read in the memoirs of the uh, Arabian princess that some Europeans also owned the slaves. So if you can say a little bit of that whole issue of the hypocrisy of the abolition movement. Yeah. Secondly, what is next for you? What are you working on right now? And what do we look forward to in the future? Thank the, you the so much. The second one would be very easy, but I'll come to that. 
<laughs> I think uh, um, with me, I feel that the race question very often has blinded us to thinking that only Arabs owned African slaves. And then the question is that these categories of Africans and so on, you come to Zanzibar and you see the population of Zanzibar. Uh, one uh, uh, Iranian reporter came and came out and said, where are the Shirazis? Because they all look black. But these people who call themselves Shirazi in Zanzibar, because they intermixed with the Persians about uh, a thousand years ago or uh, 800 years ago, and they have been completely black. They have intermarried with them. And to make racial distinctions in such a cosmopolitan society that has been going on for a thousand years, these racial divisions are artificial. They are created sometimes to fight particular battles, like during the revolution, it was quite a bit. Arab, African, Afri who is African in Zanzibar? If I was born, my grandfather was born here, am I still an Indian or an African, a Zanzibari? When does race stop? So I feel that, uh, um, and here it is known, the Shirazi was supposed to be actually more than half, I mean, they look very, very dark like, like any other. They had slaves. Even the presidents of Zanzibar, who were big revolutionaries, when you guys may talk with them and they admit, ah, yes, we know that my grandfather used to have concubines. And yet, this issue of concubinage always appears as if it is a racial one. Even Africans had slaves um, uh, in, in Zanzibar. So not to racialize the, the issue uh, so much. Uh, the second question is easier to answer. I'm going to take a rest. Oh, yes, the British show. Yeah, um, the hypocrisy that comes in the hypocrisy that comes in on the question of race and ownership of slaves. Muslims, Arabs, and others, Shirazis also own slaves. And it, that, that is very clear. Um, but quite often, you'll see only Arabs being mentioned as slave owners. Shirazi not really mentioned very much. Um, but then, um, that, uh, let me see what I wanted to say, that um, they, every, everybody coming to Zanzibar, Zanzibar, let's understand it first. 19th century Zanzibar was already integrated into the international capitalist world economy. So there were people here, Indians, Africans, Arabs, Europeans, Americans, all of them were here. They were all trading. But the Europeans would say, ah, no, we cannot own slaves. No, we have come here to abolish slavery and so on. But the Americans, in fact, one of the uh, American consul went to the Sultan and said, oh, you are terrible. You are you, me, using your slaves and all that kind of thing. And he was a trader, the American trader. If I could have asked him at that time, he said, yeah, but you are a trader here. Who is transporting your goods? He himself cannot own slaves because he's American. So what he does, he said, OK, I'm looking for uh, um, a labor contractor. Labor contractor brings 10 uh, workers. So I do not know that I'm employing slaves. I mean, this is hypocrisy. The Indians also owned slaves. They owned actually at one time because they felt that they were not under the British. So there were, some of them did buy, but uh, small numbers. We have lists of them. Um, but they were stopped uh, from this. Now, my grandfather lived at that time here. He was a businessman. Uh, in the lists that I have seen, my grandfather's name 
great grandfathers name doesn't appear. But to be honest, if he wanted to transport ivory within town from the port to his, uh, to, uh, to his uh, go down, uh, he would have used uh, contract labor. Now, when you close your eye that those actually the laborers are slaves, it's just that you are hiding yourself. Who are you deceiving? So all of them. And some of the, some of the, um, um, these uh, consuls actually even had uh, slave concubines here. And what bothered the, the, the Princess Salma in that book uh, that she wrote, what bothered her, and that is very interesting, he said, when this consul was going back home, he actually went and sold his concubine. How can you do that? But see the, the difference um, between, because a Muslim person would not have um, gone to, uh, to sell, especially if they had any uh, children. But, but there's a kind of hypocrisy um, that existed. So this is why I'm always questioned about using the race for a blanket. Be just a quick comment. I'm actually fascinated by um, your materialist reading of slavery, but you also sometimes move into the orth reading the orthodoxy, reading Islam text and hadith. So there is, uh, which is sometimes it seems like this is what, for example, the Willis and other historians that you criticize are doing, meaning looking at Islamic orthodoxy, the text and the hadith, the Quran and the hadith as a yardstick for talking about Islam. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with your argument, but I felt sometimes the over-reliance on the, on, the, on the text, the Quran and the Hadith, make you, in a way, sharing the same, which is, uh, remind me of an old text by um, the late Egyptian anthropologist Abdul Hamid Zain, who, in a, in, a, in a really seminal article, it's called Tosa and Anthropology of Islam, I'm sure you are aware of it, is that his criticism was that what shared between uh, is Islamist or Islamicist, as scholars from the West, is that the over-reliance on, on, on that, and not thinking that there are not that one Islam and many Islam. I'm sure I'm not saying anything new for you, Professor Abdul Shari, but I, it's, it's the over-reliance that I've seen in reading, and perhaps you didn't finish the, the paper, and you, 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 you talked about the materialist reading, citing you know, Marx and everything, but what do you think of this? This is just a comment, it's not mm -hmm. really a question. Oh, no, no I, I think it is legitimate and I think I agree with you, uh, not agreeing that, uh, uh, that raising the question. In fact, my argument, if it did not come out, that if you want to refer to Islamic slavery, it could be ap applicable to the time of the prophet when the prophet was there, when the issues were alive, that at that time you could say that is an Islamic way of slavery. That after that period, after that period, <clears throat> when you don't no longer have an Islamic state really legitimate, who can really um, follow uh, the rules through, people were doing whatever they wanted, and they were often doing things quite contrary to Islam. Um, and, and, and therefore, I find, for example, the, the Umayyads conquests and uh, the Abbasid exploitation of slave labor, that is un-Islamic. According to, if you define that religious as a, as a principle. Uh, so that is un-Islamic, and I will not sort of defend their behavior as Islamic. I would reject it. Um, so distance that from the religion. And, uh, but at the same time, what I'm saying is that Islam just doesn't disappear altogether uh, when, when these uh, empires come along. That, 
the people, the Muslims themselves, who still read the Quran, who still believe in the religion, if they keep certain principles uh, and practice them, for example, uh, until the 19th century, they were exploiting slave labor, but they also had slave wives, women, and they respected the children of the wives as legitimate, according to Islamic law. And I cannot describe that behavior as anything except it is Islamic, but it is, not, it, it is in a system that has already been corrupted, uh, overlaid by a non-Islamic system. I, I think this is what I, the, the distinction I would make. I certainly would not describe myself as Islamist. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I know you are not doing it. I know, but it, it should not be. Because the distinction that I'm making is that if you want to talk about Islamic slavery, the first century or so of the Prophet would still be legitimate that there is a model that was being practiced. After that one, a lot of people were doing whatever they, they wanted, and sometimes twisting to try to make it fit with their behavior. Unfortunately, I don't speak Arabic. I'm uh, Dr. Huda. I am uh, in from Saudi Arabia. Uh, can have here resident in uh, in Zanzibar from uh, Usmani from uh, Central Asia. Uh, what was the question? Whether there were slaves from there? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, there were slaves from uh, what they call uh, Circassian. Yes. Uh, in, from uh, Turkey's. Uh, yeah, Turkestan. Yes. Uh, I mean, in there were, Asia, Uzbekistan. Yes, I mean, there were some slaves who were brought from, from there, but they were very expensive. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so, the rulers uh, here, for example, in Zanzibar and some of the rich ones, could afford to buy. They were called here Circassian, Turkish. Uh, and, uh, and they were from there. And they were very light skinned, like Princess, like, uh, princess uh, Salma herself. Uh, her mother was uh, from there. Whereas uh, the mother of Bargash was Ethiopian um, as well. So, yes, they were some slaves, but they, they were very, very expensive. Uh, they, were, they, they came through Jeddah and so on, not directly from. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm a bit concerned. Uh, <laughs> um, well, a couple of things. Uh, the idea that we can divorce race from slavery or the legacies of slavery in the way we perceive race today. I mean, we're all aware of racism, particularly anti-black racism in the Arab world and in the rest of the places that are Muslim majority countries. Um, and a lot of people have kind of um, blamed the history of racism that equates black and race uh, and, and slave. Right, even though, of course, there were different kinds of slaves in there, which means they had a different value system for the different kinds of slaves that was layered based on on their perceived notions of race. So, how do you how do you really um, unbind race? Uh, and I'm not talking about Arab versus African. I don't think of those as as race, right? So race could be, it's not about the color of the skin uh, so much as how it's perceived or how it's constructed by the person who's othering, right? That's, that's one. The other thing is about uh, the hegemonic um, influence of American Academy uh, in the study uh, of, uh, of racism. Uh, in the study of slavery particularly, actually. Because, um, and how can we ever escape it? Uh, do we escape it? Uh, can we ignore it when we're talking about uh, um, slavery in other parts of the world in a different historical context and so on? Um, I mean, 
uh, is it something that we can use, criticize, and then deploy in a different way? Um, an example would be when you were giving your lecture, you were talking about, you continuously referred to southern s slave owners and how they would feel or how they would react to some of the principles from uh, either the Sharia or, I mean, from the Sunnah or um, the Quran. In many ways, we end up going back into that trap anyway. So is there any way we can deal with it and deploy it for our own purposes without falling into this kind of uh, overgeneralizing notion of slavery and race that is very much an Ameri within, kind of within the transatlantic slave uh, uh, trade as well as the American, particularly American, uh, context of racism? Racism is not a, like, like a race. If, if it, there is a race, if you want to uh, describe a race, you say all the Indians are you know, one race and things like this, when you can put any kind of label. Racism is something else. It is created. It, it is not the same thing everywhere. I mean, it is not uh, that in every society you have necessarily racism. You should not assume that. That you have to show how it has come in the first place. Now, I think I'll give one example that actually might begin to explain very nicely, which I uh, thought I might mention. Where does, when does racism come? And in fact, I can go back to a 10th century uh, booklet that was written by al Jahiz In the 10th century, just when, uh, just before the, the Zanj Rebellion started, well, a lot of slaves had already begun to be brought in large numbers. And this al Jahiz writes the book, and he titles it, the, the, the Pride of the Blacks Over the Whites. Fakhra Sudan al Baydan. Now, what does he say? He himself was mixed. The slaves were already there uh, in, in, uh, in Basra, where he was. In that booklet, Fakhra Sudan, he says, you Arabs, you have become arrogant because you have become powerful and rich. The, Arab the Arabian desert is full of um, Zanj, black people, who have been who have married Arabs, and have and they have protected your tribes, but now because you have become rich and powerful, you have become racist and you look down on blacks. Now, actually, 10th century author is telling us how racism arises. It doesn't it always, it's not always there. It is not inherited. Race might be inherited, but race, uh, I mean, race itself, you know, belonging to a particular group might, you are born. But racism develops at a certain time under certain circumstances. And, and he says very clearly um, that uh, he accuses them of, uh, of, um, that having become because of the change situation. So that when you talk about racism in the Americas, it is directly a product of how it developed. They were not born with it. How it developed there. And I think that's the distinction that I would make. We should not assume that racism exists everywhere. You may go and see racism being practiced in different kinds of ways. I mean, for example, how would you explain to an Arab family in Zanzibar, an Arab family in Zanzibar who is intermarried with, uh, with uh, let's say, an Arab in Zanzibar, intermarried with uh, the local people over several generations, their children and grandchildren have com become completely black. Would you think that his behavior will be the same as that behavior of the Americas? No. There was one particular example um, that actually I was told about during the revolution, in fact. When the revolution occurred, the, revolution, uh, the Revolutionary Council gave a command 
Now, all the people were from the town here were asked to go and assemble in one place to be, uh, to be dealt with. So he went, and his name was Muhammad Ghassani. And people who know history of the Arabs, Ghassani is one of the very old families in uh, uh, Arab history. But he was very black, very black. If you saw him, and I saw him before he died, he was very black. So he went to that compound, and when he reached there, and he saw all the people who had already arrived there, and he said, who shall I sit with? So he found a group of friends. He went and sat with them quietly. And they were all just talking. And then suddenly the revolutionary comes and says, OK, now, all Arabs on this side, Africans on that side. So he said, now, I'm an Arab. So I'm told not to go to the other side. So I began to get up. And his friends pulled him down and said, stupid, keep quiet. You want to die. Now, in that kind of situation, where is the racism? People who have intermarried like that one, would you say that it's the same racism as in the West, where even religion doesn't allow that to happen? To even, I mean, today, when a, a president announces, oh, yes, I did have a, uh, a, a son by my sl slave wife, that's a secret. This is being revealed now. So racism, we were not born with. Race, we may have been born with, but not racism. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Sharif.